morning, if you have your Bibles, and we'll turn with us to the book of Acts, chapter number 9. Amen. I was here late last night, walking the floors of the church, praying over the service, and felt an unusual burden for the service, and knowing God wanted to do something in the house this morning. And I just want to say, it's not by accident nor chance that you're here this morning. But God has ordained this service not just for your neighbor on the left or your neighbor on the right, but God has ordained this service for you. Amen. Amen. You might have just woken up this morning and decided, I think I'm going to go to church this morning. That may have just been when you realized that's what you were going to do. That God's been working behind the scenes to get you here this morning for this service. And I believe if we will Open up our ears as Revelations 2 says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. I believe we're going to hear from heaven this morning, not because it's me preaching, not because it's me behind this pulpit, but God has ordained this service, and he ordained it with you in mind. Amen. So if you visit with us, we appreciate you, but know God's been behind the scenes orchestrating this day. Amen. And I'm just believing him to do great things. Acts chapter number 9 begin our reading with verse number 1 and it reads as this and Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and he desired unto him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way or Christians of this way whether they be men or women he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem and as he journeyed he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Is it hard for thee to kick against the pricks? And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him unto Damascus. And he was there three days without sight. And neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus by the name of Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And he had seen in a vision a man named Ananias, come again and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many things of this man. How much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. He was saying, time out, Lord. He was saying the, 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 the prayer of Jesus in Gethsemane. Lord, I don't want to drink of this cup. This is a bad dude and I want nothing to do with him. I don't want to be the next notch on his belt of Christians that he has killed. I've heard many things of this man. I heard all of the evil that he's done. And he hath the authority from the chief priest to, to bind all that call on thy name. But listen to what the Lord said. The Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer. For my name's sake. In these verses, in verses 1 through 16, we find three calls that was issued for this man, Saul of Tarsus. And I feel like it's three calls that's going to be issued out in this house today for you and I. And I want to deal with the Lord to help me on the three calls of God. The three calls of of God, if you will, stretch forth your hands this way this morning and ask God to help us. Father, I love you. I am so thankful for the privilege that I have to be in your house, to be in your presence. It's not something that I take lightly or that I take for granted. 
But oh God, I am asking now for the unction, for the anointing, for the empowerment of the Holy Ghost to rest upon me. As I endeavor to declare and to preach what you've laid upon my heart. God, I'm asking that the same Spirit of God that I felt in this house last night. God would anoint us to deliver and convey your word this morning without fear, without compromise, oh God. That I could speak as the oracle of God. God, I'm asking for an anointing upon the congregation to hear and to receive and to respond to the word of God this morning. I'm asking that the light come on. I'm asking that the voice from heaven ring out. I'm asking, oh God, for you to do a work that only you can do. And we're going to forever love you and give you the praise, honor, and glory for it all. For everything that you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church says amen. Amen. And amen. The three calls of God. I want to look very briefly just for the sake of a foundation about this man called Saul. We know from, from Bible and from reading in, in various places about this man, we know that he was a religious man. He was a man that was trained at the leading theological seminary of his day. He knew the Torah, which was the law. He knew Greek traditions. He was well versed in all matters of, of religion. He was a man that had power and influence because the Bible says that he went unto the high priest to get orders from him that if he found any Christians in the way that he would bring them bound unto Jerusalem. An everyday man did not have access to the high priest. But Saul was a man of influence and power. He had authority and he rubbed elbows with the, the decision makers of his day. So he was religious. He was a man that had power and influence. And third, he was a man of great zeal. He was zealous for what he thought to be right. And if the religious crowd would look on Saul, they would look at him and say that this man's got it. This man is a good man. This man would have had all of the, the high markings that you can have on him according to religion. He looked the part. He dressed the part. He had the connections. He had the end with the, the, the authoritarians and the, the, the leaders of a day. But we can find on an ordinary day, just like today, as Saul was living his life and Saul was caught up in his religious zeal, that God absolutely wrecked his life. God absolutely turned over his apple cart. God uh, absolutely uh, changed the direction and the course of his life. And God issued some calls on his life. For the Bible says, uh, and we're going to look first and foremost at uh, the first call of God is the call for salvation. In Acts chapter 9 verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. For you see, Paul, according to the religious leaders of the day, according to his fellow man, he was a, a good man. He was a man that was doing things right. But for Saul, as he was walking on the Damascus road, the light came on. When the light of Christ shined Round about him physically, he saw uh, the, the, the holy light of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was in that moment that the light began to shine. Uh, that he saw two things that he had never seen before. Number one, he saw the greatness of his sin. Yeah. While everybody else, the religious leaders of the day, said this is a good man. He had an A plus rate, rating on the religious scale. You see, while man looked upon him and saw a good man, God looked upon him and saw a man that needed to be saved. God saw a man in need of salvation. And it was in this moment that the light shined and Saul saw the greatness of his sin. But he was also made to realize the greatness of God's salvation. God looked at a man and saw a sinner. Saw a man in need of saving. The light of Christ uh, was illuminated and shined. Uh, and uh, we see a very valuable lesson that it matters not uh, what this world thinks or says about you. Uh, it only matters what God knows about you. 
Oh, come on now. It matters not what your fellow man says. What they see and what God sees can be two total different stories and two opposite ends of the spectrum. And it's only God's thoughts that matters. It's only his thoughts that carries weight. Amen. The light came on for Saul and he saw the greatness of his sin. He saw despite his religion, despite his connections, despite his influence, that he was a man on his way to hell uh, despite what the high priest said about him uh, despite the endorsement that he carried on his life uh, when he saw the light of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, he was smitten in his heart with conviction uh, the light uh, amen illuminated uh, and the greatness of the sin and the need for uh, salvation for us uh, we must have that light shine uh, in our hearts and in upon our lives uh, Saul saw a physical light from heaven uh, but we we must have a spiritual life that goes off uh, inside of every one of our lives uh, when we have the same experience. Uh, for us, uh, we too have to have an encounter with the light uh, of Christ to where we see uh, the greatness of our sin, uh, but we're also made to realize uh, the greatness of His salvation. Uh, the Word of God says uh, in 2 Corinthians 4 and 3, uh, but the gospel uh, be hid, it is him to them that are lost. Uh, and in the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which uh, uh, believe not, lest the light uh, of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine uh, unto them. I can tell you, folks, the light uh, is still shining today. Uh, the light of the glorious gospel uh, is still shining as bright today uh, as it has ever been. Uh, and we must have an encounter uh, with the light uh, the same way Saul had an encounter with the light. For Saul, it was a physical light. But for us, it must be a spiritual light to where the scales fall from our eyes. And we see God in His holiness and His splendor and His majesty. And when that occurs, we're going to see us in the light of our unholiness and our unrighteousness. The Bible says, our righteousness which is as a filthy rags. You see, when this light of the glorious gospel shines and we see the righteousness of God, we're going to be acutely aware of how righteous He is Amen. and how unrighteous we are. And we're going to be face to face with the same decision that Saul of Tarsus had to make. You see, he saw the light. We're dealing with the call. But then he also heard the voice. As he saw the light, he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Is it hard for thee to kick against the pricks? The call, Saul's call was made up of two things. It was made up of the light, and it was made up with a voice. The same must occur in our lives when we see the light of the glorious gospel for what it is and we hear the voice of God for what he says. Amen. Saul, we mentioned, was a religious man, but for the first time in his life, he heard the voice of God. God called him, called him by name, said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Here's a boy that sat at the feet of Gamaliel, the leading theologian of his day. For his students, I read one time that it was the goal of Gamaliel that by the age of 12, his students would know from memory all 613 laws. A man who instructed the brightest of the bright, the best of the best, and Saul was among that crowd. He was religious. He knew the law. He knew what to do. He knew uh, all the lingo. But when God spoke to him on this Damascus road, uh, he had absolutely no clue who was talking. That can 
let us know you can be the most religious person under the sun. But religion does not mean you've heard God's voice. You can hear the best preaching in the world. But that is no substitute for God's voice. You can have the best Sunday school teacher in the world. And sat under him and learned John 3.16. And learned the Roman road. And learn, amen, all of the things about religion. But unless you've heard the voice of God, you haven't heard anything. Every man must be brought to this crucible moment in his life when he has an encounter with the light and when he hears the voice and the call of God for himself. God's called me, amen, and God's called others, amen, but that's no answer for your call on your life that you have to answer for yourself. I can't do it. The board can't do it for you. The Sunday school teacher can't do it for you. But you're going to be brought face to face this morning with the light and the voice and how you respond is going to be totally up to you. Saul knew everything about religion but he knew nothing about God. And I'm fearful God help me that we've raised a generation that can fall into the same category. They know every aspect of religion, the do's and don'ts, but they have not had an encounter with God for themselves. That's why the second that they graduate high school, they walk out those doors and they go to a liberal institution what they call an institution of higher learning, that within six months they renounce everything that they've taught, been taught to be true. Because we've taught them what to believe, but we've not taught them why to believe it. And it never became personal to them. Saul was such a man, religious, but lost. I can tell you, folks, there is no substitute for the light of Christ Amen. and it heard his voice. Yeah, right. For the first time in his life, he heard the voice of one speaking and he received a true revelation of Christ because he asked the question when God issued his call and said, Saul, Saul, he asked the question, who art thou, Lord? He didn't know who was speaking, but it's very interesting terminology that he used there when he said, who art thou, Lord? In just one moment of time, he was made aware of the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. The very man that he ridiculed and mocked and was out to persecute all of his believers when he stood face to face with him, he realized, amen, the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And the Holy Ghost began working in his life. Because Saul called him Lord. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 3. Where, For I give you to understand that no man speaketh by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. And that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Holy Ghost began working. God issued the call. The Holy Ghost was working in Saul's heart. And immediately he fell on his knees and he acknowledged him as Lord. Listen, he didn't rely on the law. He didn't rely on Moses or David or some other prophet. He didn't rely off Peter or some testimony. But when he saw Christ for himself, everything that he knew died that day. Every ounce of religion that he had held on to for all of those years. Amen. It perished and fell on the ground as dung because he realized that he had rejected and he hadn't known the truth. But on that day, truth was standing right in front of him. Amen. Truth was calling him by name, saying, Saul, Saul. Amen. Bringing him face to face with an encounter with the light, with the liberty, the love, and the voice of Almighty God. Listen, this encounter must be repeated, amen, to every single believer. There's going to be a moment in time where all of us, if we're born again, amen, we're going to hear God's voice. We're going to see his light. Maybe not physically the way that Saul heard it. Amen, maybe not physically the way that Saul saw and heard it, but God is going to speak in his own way. God's going to shine the light of his glorious gospel. And in that moment, everything you think you know about him, has to die. Every preconceived notion that you have has to 
should be lying in waste at his feet. Amen. We've got to see God and encounter him for who he is and what he's desiring to do in our hearts and in our lives. Religion produces death. God's spirit produces a quickening life. And only he can give. Listen, you go. I ain't going to call a bunch of names about different denominations. Amen. But there's a hundred churches in Baldwin County that's got a religious name over the door. But you walk into it this morning and you're going to find death. You're going to find white and sepulchers full uh, of dead men's bones. Uh, they're going to have the name. Uh, oh, but they're going to have no life there. What, what's happened? Uh, they have religion, uh, but they don't have Christ. Uh, everywhere Christ is, uh, he will produce life. Uh, and life everlasting. Uh, and life more abundantly. Uh, and God is bringing us to that point this morning uh, to where we can experience and know his life. Life. Saul so asked the question. He said, Who art thou, Lord? A very sincere question. When he asked the question, God fully revealed himself. Now, but I want you to notice something. God didn't leave you hanging. But God will reveal himself to any man who asked. Every man must receive the revelation of who this Christ is. It must be personal. But I want you to notice verse 7. Here it is. A light shining from heaven. A voice crying out to him. A call for salvation. But in verse number 7, Paul received the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in verse 7, And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. You see, these men heard the sound. They saw the effects. But they did not receive the revelation and fullness of who Jesus is. Which leads us to this point. This revelation must be personal. Christ will reveal himself to any man. But he will not reveal himself to every man. In this story... Only one man received the revelation and fullness because only one man asked. But there was still a crowd that was there that had the opportunity. That's why you can preach a message and the Holy Ghost be there and conviction be so thick in the house. And you can still have people walk up out of their pew and leave lost. Because they've not received the revelation of Christ in his fullness. Some people want him, some people don't. But for the ones that want him, God longs to reveal himself. God will reveal himself to any man that asks. In this story, only one man received the revelation of Christ because only one man asked. Brother Kevin, I'm fully persuaded that if the others would have asked, they could have received the same revelation. But there was no desire there for the things of God. Out of this light, God, God called him. Saul, Saul, and asked him the question, is it hard for thee to kick against the pricks? Now, word kick against the pricks there, the, the word picture in the Greek is like an ox pick. An ox goad when a, you were plowing a field with an ox and you would, you would pluck him in the side with that ox goad to get him to steer in the right direction. Said, Saul, Saul, I've had my goad out. I've been trying to get you to turn around. Where were the pricks of conviction? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. Was it at the feet of, uh, of the stoning of Stephen that he was there that God began dealing with his heart? Was it uh, some of the Christians that he was having persecuted and delivered into jail and to be in prison? Was it then that God was convicting his heart? I, I don't know. But to this point, Saul had been rejected. Saul had been uh, overriding the pricks of conviction that was in his heart uh, that God was trying to use. Uh, but I want you to notice something. God did not give up on Saul. Even though at some point conviction had been there and Saul had overridden it, uh, God did not give up on him, but God kept convicting him. Uh, 
God kept pricking his heart uh, with conviction. Uh, and at this moment in time, the pricks uh, was more than he can bear. Uh, oh, we see the long suffering and the mercy of God uh, as God was dealing with his heart uh, and dealing with his life. Uh, amen. God, uh, amen, did not give up on Saul. Uh, and can I tell you to this point this morning, God uh, has not given up on you. Uh, you might have felt pricks of conviction for months on end, uh, but you've overridden it now not the time. Now is not the opportunity like Agrippa. I'm going to wait for a convenient, more convenient season. Can I tell you this morning is the convenient season. You might have overridden conviction last week. You might have overridden conviction yesterday but today God is back. I can't speak for tomorrow. I don't know but right now today God by His Spirit is dealing with hearts and lives and the same way He called out to Saul by name God's calling out your name. Amen. Saying you, you. Amen. Why is it hard for you to kick against the pricks? I'm back. I'm not letting you go. Submit. Surrender. And you'll see my salvation in its fullness. Man. Why anybody would want to reject the conviction of God? I don't know. Because it's the most blessed thing a man can receive. Because if you're feeling conviction, that lets you know God has not finished with you yet. God loves you enough to convict you. God loves you enough to convert you. I'm going to say that again. If God loves you enough to convict you, God loves you enough to convert you. Listen, I believe in a whosoever will. Salvation, let him come. But I heard one preacher say, and it stuck with me. He said, while I believe in a whosoever, I don't believe in a whensoever. You better come when God's convicting you. You better come when God is dealing with you. Amen, because we're not promised another day of conviction. We're not promised another day with God dealing with your heart and with your life. I remember, I can, I can vouch for that my own self. Amen, being a boy. Amen, I, I talked earlier about the wickedness, and I ain't proud of any of that junk. But I can tell you, even in drug and alcohol and induced states, there were times I'd be passed out on the couch. And I'd come to you the next morning, and people would tell me, said, you were saying some off-the-wall things while you were out. What was I saying? He said, you had tears running down your face, and you were saying, God, don't let me die like this. Don't let me die like this. Lord, don't come back tonight. I'm going to be left. That happened on more than one occasion. You see, but even during that time, Brother Daniel, I went a long time without feeling conviction. I went a long time knowing I was lost. Knowing if I were to die, I was on my way to hell. But I didn't feel conviction. There were times when I wanted to feel conviction. There were times when I went to church wanting to feel something. I didn't feel anything. That's why when God called my number, amen, on a night, just a Tuesday night service at a youth camp, my life was messed up in shambles. There was a call of salvation that issued out to me. And once you go a long time without conviction, knowing you're lost and knowing you're on your way to hell but not feeling anything, when you find out that God loves you enough to still convict you, I knew not to take it for granted. I knew not to brush it aside. But when everybody else was returning from the altar and done with the service, that's when I ran to the altar. Man, because I heard God's call of salvation. I heard the call of God on my life. And he spoke to me very plainly, called me by my name. And said, I, Corey said, I, I will never deal with you on this fashion again. Now, I can't answer that as a 16-year-old. That, that, that sounds like a very uh, a difficult thing to try to digest. And I knew not to take it lightly. But I knew the voice of God well enough to know that when he speaks, he doesn't stutter. And when he speaks, 
He don't make mistakes. Uh, amen. And looking back on it now, uh, that was a very true statement because, uh, amen, if I would have brushed off conviction that night, I could have died and gone to hell. Uh, or I could have steeped further and deeper in sin and carried a whole lot of scars. I uh, might have disqualified myself from ministry. I don't know. Uh, but I know, thank God, uh, amen, the Holy Ghost convicted me. Uh, and there was enough faith in my heart to respond to God's call of salvation. Uh, and 19 years later, here I am. Amen. I'm telling somebody this morning, uh, there's a call being issued. Uh, God's still calling people unto salvation. Uh, whosoever will, uh, let him come. Uh, and he's, if he's convicting your heart this morning, uh, don't take it lightly. Uh, don't brush it aside, uh, but embrace it. Uh, thank God for it. Uh, and let him change your life. Amen. Amen. God's call of salvation. Secondly, we not only see a call of salvation, but we see a call of separation. Because God was speaking to Ananias. And the Lord spoke to him and said, Go thy way, for this man is a chosen vessel unto me. God said he's a chosen vessel. The word chosen in the Greek is the Greek word ekloge, which means the act of picking out or choosing. It means a thing or a person that has been chosen. It's a derivative from the word eklogomai, which means to pick, to choose for oneself. Choosing out of many as Jesus chose the disciples. There were many people that he could have chosen, but he chose 12 and said, these are mine. It's choosing a one for an office. Like Aaron the high priest. There were many Levites that God that were qualified for the office of high priest. But God said, I choose Aaron. I pick Aaron out of the crowd. He is going to be my person. David, there were many people that God could have picked to be king. As a matter of fact, there were 11 other brothers that were more qualified than David. That looked apart. That acted the part. But David, God said, none of them are in. He picked David out of the 12 and said, this is my man. He's going to be king over my people. That is exactly what God did with Saul. He chose Saul out of the crowd. You see, we have a church phrase for that. It's called sanctification. It's called to be chosen. It's called to, to be selected. It's called to, to be picked out. This is what sanctification is. God's call to sanctification among the believers is just as real as God's call to salvation for the lost. Amen. When we are to separate ourselves, and I know you start dealing with sanctification. I've been preaching this long enough. Folks start getting tense and squirming around in the pews a little bit. Heart rate gets to beating and elevating. And let me just go ahead and address the elephant in the room when it comes to sanctification. In sanctification, you've got two extremes on the opposite end of the spectrum. You've got one that nothing is wrong, everything's covered in grace, and sanctification is just an archaic church word that we don't deal with anymore. Then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you've got those uh, that in their, uh, their, their zeal, uh, amen, they have made extremes out of sanctification and made it a rule book that they themselves cannot follow. And they preach a bunch of junk uh, that they can't even live themselves. Uh, and it gives sanctification a bad name uh, that by their rule book, ain't nobody going to make it in the city. I got that's right and three chuckles. Amen. <laughs> I can tell you both ends of the spectrum are wrong. So let's go ahead and address the elephant in the room. Amen. When it comes to sanctification, if you're looking on either end of the spectrum, you're focusing on the wrong thing. When it comes to sanctification, you focus on the one rule book that matters, and that is the B-I-B-L-E. You focus on the one person that matters, not a matter of man, but the one man, J-E-S-U-S. -E he is going to lead you and guide you into all truth, and you don't have to worry about pleasing anybody on either end of the spectrum. When you follow after Christ, you're going to walk like Christ. 
Christ. Uh, you're going to talk like Christ. Uh, amen. When you get full of the Holy Ghost, uh, amen, you're going to live in the Spirit. You're going to dwell in the Spirit. Uh, and sanctification is going to take care of itself. Uh, but I can tell you uh, there is still a call uh, that is a call upon every believer uh, to come out from among the world uh, and be you separate. What is the separation? Uh, it's Christ in us. Uh, oh, hallelujah. It's Christ alive in us uh, that is the separating and the distinguishing factor uh, of us and the between us and the world. Uh, and it is a message that still must be preached. Uh, God still demands sanctification uh, and separation in His church. How do I do it? How do I? It's like you get in the book and you follow Christ. If there's any question marks, he's going to take care of every question mark. You don't have to look to a man because man can fall. And you don't have to walk around loosey-goosey with no convictions either. Amen, because I can tell you God ain't in that. Get in the book. Find out what God wants for you. And live it out in shoe leather every day of your life. And say, I'm going to be separate. I'm going to be different. It was separation that distinguished the three Hebrew boys and Daniel. While everybody else was wheat, eating meat offered unto idols. Now, eating filet mignons and ribeyes and lobster tails. They said, we want none of that. We're going to be separate. We're going to be different. And what happened? God honored that separation. God honored that separation. When you come out from among the world and you're different, honey, God will honor it a thousand out of a thousand times. I mean, there's never been anything that you've laid down for the cause of Christ that God didn't honor. There's never been anything that Christ has told you to pick up and you pick up and he hadn't honored and had respect unto it. Amen. Separation. Listen, we are to separate ourselves. For Christ. Listen, September the 28th, 10, we'll make 10 years. I stood in front of a church and I made a vow not only to my beautiful pride, but to the preacher, to the congregation, and to God. I made a vow of separation. When I said, I'm availing myself to you and everybody else. Is out of the equation. <clears throat> Ten years later, in September, I've been true to that vow. I hadn't had any side chicks. I hadn't had any girlfriends <laughs> on the side. <laughs> She'd kill me if I did. <laughs> but there's power and consecration in that vow. Number one, because I love her, I don't want anybody else. I don't want to do anything to jeopardize the love that I have for her. The, the respect that I have for those two babies. Amen. I love them enough to not step out on her. And if we take that vow as sacred and holy before God, how much more should our vow with God be taken in the same regard? We shouldn't be committing adultery with every whoredom that comes down the pike in the world. We should be separate unto God. We should live sanctified and holy lives. Lord, I, I'm separating myself from the world, but I'm separating myself unto you. There is still a call for separation in this world. Only those that are separated now are going to be separated in the final analysis when the rapture of the church takes place and the church is separated and we're called out. It takes separation today if you expect to be separated then. He's calling unto sanctification. You mean you may ask what this world looks like. I'm going to read you a snippet from the best rule book there is. Not from a man-made rule book, but from the Word of God. When this same man that God said is a chosen, is a separated yes. vessel unto me. He gave the best synopsis of separation that you can find in the word of God in Ephesians 4. 
When he said, This I say therefore and testify the Lord that ye henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. In other words, don't walk as everybody else in the world is walking. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance of that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling hath given themselves over to lasciviousness, the work of all uncleanliness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so, that ye have heard him and have been told by him as the truth in Jesus, that putting off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye put on the new man, which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for whom I, ye members one of another, be ye angry and sin not. Let the sun not go down on your wrath, wrath never, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him that labor working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have given, to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed into the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sakes, hath forgiven you. Listen, if you commit yourselves to fulfilling every, every command of God in this scripture as it opposes to sanctification, you don't have time for any of man's legalism. You just live this out in shoe leather. Amen. And it'll be all that you can do and more to stay in line with the word of God. If you want to be holy, live out Ephesians 4. If you want to be right with God, if you're born again and you want to live a separated lifestyle, live these verses out. This comes from the same man that God chose to be a vessel unto him. And these will be verses that will apply to you when God chooses you. Please, God. Galatians 1 and 15. Who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me. That I may preach among the heathen immediately. I conferred not with flesh and blood three things that please God in these verses. That please God to separate us. Please God to call us unto grace. And that please God to reveal his son. I can tell you no. These three things are still the greatest pleasures of God today. It pleases God to reveal his son in us. It pleases God. When we are called and we walk in his grace. It pleases God. Amen. When we walk in separation and true holiness before God. He's calling some this morning unto salvation. He's calling some this morning unto separation. But lastly, the last call of God. He's calling people for service. And now verse 9, 15. We've already read the first part. Go thy way for he is a chosen vessel unto me. But here's what he was chosen to do. To bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. You see, lives of salvation and sanctification will become lives of service in honor of the king. You can't get the cart before the horse and say, I, I want to serve. You can't serve without being saved. That's the building block and the, the foundation for everybody. You must be born again. After you're born again, God's going to call you into separation. How do you know that? He called Paul. I'm, we may preach this tonight. He Before Paul, the first thing he did was he tried to fill that life of service. After he had scales fall from his eyes, he went straight down to the synagogue and started trying to preach. Set off a ride in the city. They tried to kill him. God said, before you try this again, go to Arabia for the span of three and a half years. Get along with me. I've started to work, but there's a whole lot more that I have to do with you, boy. And when I'm done, amen, you're going to, that chosen vessel is going to shine. When you're saved, when that separation takes place, you will live a life of service for the king. Let's just look at some of the acts of service. Paul was known as an apostle to the Gentiles. 
After his encounter with Jesus, Paul made his life mission to bring the gospel beyond the Jewish communities. He had to tell somebody of what Jesus had done for him. He had to tell his testimony. He, he was bursting and bubbling up on the inside of him to tell somebody about the goodness of God. And I can tell you, when you're truly born again, the same thing's going to happen to you. You're going to have to tell somebody about what Jesus has done. Right. Amen. He was an apostle to the Gentiles. Service. He was a missionary. Over the course of his life, Paul made three, possibly four missionary journeys, each lasting multiple years, during the which he planted churches all across Europe and Asia Minor. Service to the king. He was a leader. Paul did more to spread Christianity in the first century than any other person. Played a role crucial in the church in unifying the church, formally defining Christian beliefs. He was one that wrought miracles. He would lay hands on people. The Holy Ghost would move in him and move through him and flow out of him. Divine miracles and encounters would take place. Drove out spirits, healed the sick. Raised somebody from the dead. He lived a life beyond himself. A life of service to the king. He was an author. As a matter of fact, 13 books that you read in the collective book called the Bible was authored by this man. It was written as he was a holy man of old. Inspired by the Holy Ghost. His life was given in service for the church. It started with a call of salvation. Kirsten, if you don't have me, I'm done. A call of salvation, a call of separation, and a call of service. I can tell you without fail, I'm going to give an altar call that's going to hit every single person in this room. I'm going to bat a thousand because I can confidently say that these are three calls that are being issued this morning to everybody in this house. If you're here and you're lost, God's calling you unto salvation. The light of his glorious gospel is shining. His voice is calling out from heaven the same way he called Saul, Saul. He's calling out your name. It's calling out your name. Amen. You may say on the outside everything looks good. But when you see the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know within yourself that heart knows better than anybody on the outside. God's issuing that call out today. It's time to come home. Saul, you've been kicking against the pricks. But I'm going to keep pricking you until you give in day on the Damascus Road. Amen. It had all come to fruition. The conviction, the light, the voice. And that day a man's life was forever changed. God wants to change somebody's life. And by the way, this morning if you hear me, you are saved. God's calling us unto sanctification, unto separation. It matters not whether you've been saved five minutes or whether you've been saved 55 years. That call never stops. Never stops. To continue. It's one thing to separate yourself. But it's something to continue living that life of separation. Because if we're not careful, the later we get in this game, the one thing, the things that we lay down, if we're not careful, we'll begin to pick them back up. So we must continue walking. Amen. In the light of this gospel, continue conformity to Christ by the working of the Holy Ghost to conform us in the nature and the image of Christ. God is continuing that call this morning. And he's calling us in the lives of service for the King. From the youngest to the oldest, there's something you can do for the kingdom of God. There's things that you can do for the kingdom that I never can. There's things that I'll do for the kingdom that you never will. That's why we are part of the collective body of the Christ. And the number one mission of that body must be service to the king. As he speaks, we obey. As he speaks, as he commands, 
we carry it out. Amen. In faithfulness to that call and that commission. This morning, God's calling. Three distinct and undeniable calls upon the life of Saul. Three distinct and undeniable calls unto each and every one of us today. Amen. If you'll stand with me all over the building, I'm done. Amen. If you're here this morning and you say, I'm lost. I'm lost. And I need God's call in my name. God's been convicted me right now. My heart's racing out of my chest. I, I know God, God's dealing with me this morning. And I'm ready to surrender. I'm, I'm ready to submit. I'm ready for God to change who I am from Saul to Paul. I'm ready to God for God to change everything about me. I, I'm sick of where I am. I'm sick of the failure that my life has become. I'm sick of everything that, that I try to do. It just slips right through my hands. God's calling out to you this morning. Right where you are, all heads bowed. All our hearts are praying. If you'll say, that's me. This morning, just very quickly, we're about to change the order. Very quickly. I'm lost this morning, preacher. I need to be saved. God sees that hand. God sees this hand. You're not alone in what you're feeling. You're not alone where you are. Very quickly, there's more. God sees and God knows. We're not going to believe you. We're not going to drag this out. Amen. But you hear, I, I need to be saved this morning. Quickly, slip up your hand. Hallelujah. There's some that's here this morning. God's going to save. God's going to do a work. Amen. If you're here this morning and you are saved, amen, this altar call should be 100% of the rest of you. Amen. God's calling you into a deeper walk. God's calling you into a deeper level of separation. God's calling you into service. Amen. Why don't you that raise your hand and those, the rest of you, slip out of your pew and meet God in the altar this morning. Amen. Meet Him here this morning. Come on to the altar this morning. Hallelujah.